I'm Annie Wood. I serve on the board for Food of the North, and we are so grateful that you have chosen to learn with us tonight. Um, with a variety of things that are happening in the world around us with COVID and the number of racial injustices, our, our board felt like it was really important for us um, to take time to learn more about food justice. And so um, tonight we are really pleased to have with us Ruth Buffalo, uh, Shirley Nordstrom, Nate Erickson, and Jamie Bain, who are all amazing educators and folks who are doing a lot of incredible work in this space. And so uh, from the, our Food of the North team, we really want to extend a warm welcome and a hearty thank you to them for, uh, for being willing to share their time and expertise with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to our moderator for the evening, uh, Ruth Buffalo, and have her give us a short Food Justice 101 to sort of give us um, some foundational information so that we are ready to learn together. So Ruth, are you ready? So, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Nido Shadzao, Madashi Mia Adesh Heads, Mabe Sigids. Hello, good people. Um, how are you? Um, my name is Ruth Buffalo, and I just greeted you in the Hiradza language. Um, also want to acknowledge the land that we're on here in the Red River Valley of the, those of the Anishinaabe people and the Dakota people. Um, and I'm a citizen of the Mandan, Hiradza, and Rikra Nation. And it's um, so important for me to follow our tribal protocols um, out of respect for you and um, my family and, and all of our ancestors. So I am honored to be in this virtual space with you this evening and I am going to share a little bit about my story, my history um, as a Hiradza woman, um, we say a hundredth generation here in North Dakota um, and also talk about food justice and as we begin this conversation I want you to kind of, I want you to think of um, what does food justice mean to you and how can we make change from where we're at. Um, and that could be big or small, even as, um, as easy as a simple share uh, on different topics that you might hear um, in this discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to start real quick. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that I'm a 100th generation North Dakotan. And for me, what that means is that um, historically, the Hidadza, um, the Mandan, Hidadza, and Urkara Nation uh, people were historically um, agricultural people. Um, we lived along the banks of the Missouri River. Um, we were further south in what is present day Standing Rock. And then as time moved on, we also moved further up north um, of the Missouri River to where we're located today. And so being historically um, agricultural people, we um, didn't move around as much. Um, and that's why you see the types of um, living quarters that we lived in. We lived in huge earth lodges, um, but so much to cover in such little time. But I, I wanted to touch on some important topics. Um, I mentioned that the MHA nation was historically agricultural people. Well, in the early um, 1950s, 94% um, of our agricultural land was flooded. Um, through the Pix Loan Act, um, the Garrison Dam was made as a result. And many people, not just the MHA Nation citizens, were affected, but people from across um, North Dakota were impacted. And specifically um, to the tribal nation of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Urkara Nation, um, their entire lifestyle was, was uprooted and basically turned upside down. Um, they were relocated once again to rough, high, barren graze land, um, and they had to start all over, um, basically, in trying to um, to regain their sense of um, their economy. And so their way of life was disrupted. Um, many people relocated to larger cities. My grandparents, um, who are farmers and ranchers, um, they decided to stay. Um, but as a result, they faced some challenges, um, in particular with the last name Buffalo. Um, my grandpa um, changed his last name to a more English sounding last name so that he could find work off of the reservation. So um, although this impact directly impacted a lot of people um, in, the, in and around the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation on the western side of the state, um, many people weren't very, um, didn't have the privilege to really bounce back as others might have, which included my grandpa. Um, and so 
today when I think of food justice, I think of um, the struggles that my grandparents went through, the struggles that are still existing today, and what can we do to find justice um, through food. Food offers so many um, wonderful things, you know, it could, it provides healing for us. Um, and some might think food justice, you know, so it's so very broad. And I want to say that myself, I, when I think of food justice, I think of clean, healthy food, free from any chemicals. Um, and I mentioned healing because healing is so very important, um, especially in today's day and age. Um, and we think of lack of access to food. You know, we know a lot of our tribal nations, low income communities across the state are facing uh, very big challenges in these COVID-19 times. Um, we know that a lot of the food that is uh, readily accessible, like say in gas stations, is not good for us. It's not healthy. Um, I used to teach and coach at a tribal college in Bismarck, North Dakota, United Tribes Technical College, um, for several years, seven years exactly. Um, and I used to teach health and wellness classes. And we really dove deep into systems. Um, we talked about healthy options. And through exploring that with the students, we found that healthier options oftentimes cost more. And that really hasn't changed um, since, you know, for a number of years. I have um, was at the Tribal College in Bismarck from 2011, or 2004 to 2011. Um, but <clears throat> the struggle still remains in trying to find healthy options that are affordable for everyone. Um, we also looked at uh, policies and the ways that policies were enacted. Um, if you look at the timeline of different communities such as tribal nations, um, there were a lot of bad policies that were enacted um, way back as far as like the Dawes Act, Indian Reorganization Act, um, where rations were held or withheld um, within reservations. We look at the buffalo, how that was a very huge source of food and economy um, for many tribal nations in the plains. And so with, um, with the removal, the Indian Removal Act um, also came a lot of different uh, things, bad things by design that were basically meant to diminish an entire population. And so be thinking of policies as we, we go out, go through this, this conversation this evening um, on how policies have the opportunity to improve the quality of life for people. Um, and in particular, when we think of food justice, we think of um, finding justice. You know, today we have racial justice, economic justice, and food justice is a new um, buzzword, but it, it also falls in line with food sovereignty um, in understanding our history and where we're going today. And so there is hope, you know, throughout this pandemic, we have, we have witnessed many tribal nations across the United States really get back to gardening. Um, for example, in South Dakota, I know that many are planting record numbers of gardens, community gardens. And so we really want to stress the importance of self-sufficiency self and really getting back to many tribal nations roots. Um, and there's also that science behind putting your hands in the dirt in the garden. Um, it's a, there's a strong sense of connection to the land. And again, when we go back to these, the policies that were enacted um, where Native Americans survived genocide. And so certain Poor policies were put in place intentionally to basically uh, wipe out the entire population of Native Americans. And that included um, severing the connection to land, hence the boarding school era, um, and many other things. So I don't want to take too much time on, on talking about myself, but I just wanted to provide some context to give you um, a snapshot of, of the tribal nation that I'm a citizen of. But it's also important to keep in mind that there are 55 plus 
different tribal nations um, throughout the United States. And each one is very unique and similar, but unique in our geographic location. So it's, it's so important to um, not paint uh, the entire Native American population with a broad stroke. And I would encourage you to, to get to know each other um, and ask, ask those uncomfortable questions and because through conversation that's how we grow and learn together so i am going to introduce our panelists um, we have shirley nordrum she is an amazing lady she is um, works with the university of minnesota extension federally recognized tribal extension program and she's an educator for the Leech Lake, Red Lake and White, White Earth Nations. Her, fo her focus is on preserving and increasing access to and knowledge of traditional Ojibwe food systems. Her educational focus is on Anishinaabe traditional ecological knowledge, the gifts of the individual and the collective actions and decisions of the community. And the second panelist is Nate. <clears throat> Nate Erickson is an extension educator with the University of Minnesota and a co-founder of the nonprofit MNU Inc. He's originally from Melrose, Minnesota. He is an avid lover of gardening, reading, reading, and professional wrestling. He also hopes to change the way people think about their local food systems. And our third panelist is Jamie Bain. <clears throat> she is a natural weaver, connector, and collaborator. Working on food justice, Jamie believes that through authenticity, imagination, playfulness, and deep connectivity, we can find the solution to life's wicked problems together. She recognizes her inherent power as a cisgendered, heterosexual, white female, working for a large ac academic institution and living and working on land taken from the Dakota people in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She uses her power to push for restorative justice within the white dominant circles she has the privilege of being invited into. She also listens and feels, feels for common ground with communities and organizations who want to co-create a food system that is meant to nourish everyone. Jamie is an undergrad undergraduate degree, has an undergraduate degree in nutrition, a master's degree in public health, and is a lifelong learner in the areas of joy and love. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first panelist, um, Shirley. Madzigirads, thank you. Anin, bonjour. Um Banesakwe and Dugu, Wabajeshi and Dudame, Misko Gwamwe Zag Igening and Dunjaba, Gamisko Wakokag and Dunjaba. So like Ruth mentioned, um it's really important for us to follow our tribal um protocols and traditions. And so I greeted you tonight in Ojibwe. Um when I speak that, uh, my ancestors hear me, um the spirits around me hear me, and they come to support me in whatever it is I'm going to say. Um, so what I told you was is that my uh, my, my Ojibwe name, my spirit name, uh, the one that, you know, Chile is just a name on my driver's license, okay? So in my community, I'm Bene Sequoia, I'm the Thunderbird woman, and I'm of the Martin clan. My dad was from the Martin clan. So the clan structure is really important. Um, the Martin is uh, a warrior and as most warriors and soldiers in any kind of uh, system, we are also the um, taker care, you know, we take care of the food. Um, because when you're in a, either a defensive or offensive mode, um, the food for your people is really important. Um, my mom uh, was of the Bear Clan. And so the Bear Clan are protectors and they're medicine people. So I feel like I have aspects and attributes of both growing up with them. And so my first slide that's up here uh, is um, some photographs of a, of a Nishinaabe or Ojibwe um, seasonal life cycle of food. Um, that's all it was about was, was eating well, living well. If you were eating well, you were living well. And so our, our, um, our food system was seasonal. And we start up in the, uh, you know, your left hand uh, upper corner there is Iskamiza Gawin, the uh, sugar bush or the maple sugar harvest and you know we were 
we were hunter gatherers and a small agriculturalist. We we did um, corn, bean, squash, and sunflowers. We had a four sister system that uh, we relied heavily upon. And so that that elderly lady over there in the corner, uh, she's she's slicing up a squash, gonna hang it up to dry. That's that's how we preserve that. Um, the elderly man down in the corner with all his corn. Um, we have the kids picking berries, um, people out Menominee ricing, and then uh, you know in the winter time we did a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting. So I grew up this way. This is uh, my my parents were. Uh, I kind of thought we were poor, I guess, watching the other kids around, but um, this is how we lived, and I, I'm thinking that we were actually very rich. Um, and I didn't realize that this way of life, these skills that they were giving me, would end up coming into my work. Um, I, I developed the environmental department for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Um, I was 25 when I started that program or that department. And one of the first things I was working on was a super fun site. And um, we were exploring the contaminants at the site and how those affected a traditional uh, Ojibwe lifestyle. And, you know, I just started talking about it and uh, they're like, wow, you, you know, you kind of know what you're doing there through the seasons. And, and I'm like, yeah. So um, myself and a couple of other um, folks from across the nation, uh, Stuart Harris from Umatilla and uh, um, Rowan White, uh, Haudenosaunee from out east. Uh, some of us were very instrumental in developing a traditional uh, indigenous human health risk assessment that EPA now can use to, uh, to look at sites that uh, are indigenous territory. And then those skills and knowledge came into play again uh, in my role with the University of Minnesota in uh, educating uh, being an educator for the Leech Lake, Red Lake, and White Earth bands, um, all those nations were very interested in revitalizing traditional uh, food knowledge and, and skills around traditional food systems. So, um, so if we move to the next slide, um, Annie, thank you. Um, I've been deeply exploring the history of food, and I'm going to share with you tonight some thoughts that I have on my food stories by no means any near complete, but just some really interesting thoughts. Um, so I like this picture because uh, it shows a grid overlaying a beautiful landscape. And that's exactly what happened with the 1785 land ordinance um, when they started um, quartering off the land into six mile by six mile um, townships, you know, marching their way across from east to west doing that and they the surveyors that were doing this were also taking copious notes of uh, resources that they thought were of value and they laid this grid across the land with no thought to you know biologically dependent systems ecosystems and it, it really damaged the land and it continues to do that because you know ownership you know these these natural systems don't pay attention to to boundaries and, and so it makes it really difficult for any plant community or animal or bird community to really um, establish themselves well when you have mixed management of these, these systems. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so when the Europeans, the settlers, uh, whoever, however you wanna to refer to them, when they came and they were you know, inventorying everything that was of value, they brought a very different um, economic system to it. It was an extractive economy. So anything that was of value would be, you know, harvested or, you know, take all of it. And it's really interesting that, you know, um, in Ojibwe, we have a, a teaching about a spirit being, he's called the Windigo. And um, a lot of people are even scared to say that name because the Windigo is, is, a, is a dangerous being in that um, he's a cannibal. And when he eats, um, he just grows and his, his appetite becomes insatiable and he grows to the point where he becomes so powerful um, that it's hard to control him. And that's kind of how uh, myself and Winona Leduc and others were talking about it. It's extractive economy it is a lot like that, that Windigo. But this system also just had an apocalyptic effect on 
indigenous food system because our food system is kind of now what they call natural resources i kind of don't like that term because it it lends itself to the construct of a commodified natural world and it is i don't like it but sometimes you got to use it so um next slide i was reading you know about our food and i was reading some studies coming out of canada uh, canada has a better handle on the indigenous diet uh, than we do down here in america and uh, i was reading this article i think it was called the vanishing indian um, terrible title um, it was written by an anthropologist by the name of barish and he introduced me to this uh this term here nutricide and i was like wow um nutricide what the heck is that and so you know as i read on it it, it it's explained that there's like two definitions of nutricide like the intentional causing or bringing about the death of a large number of people through nutritional manipulation and also the intentional causing or bringing about a death of a large body of knowledge concerning food and uh, so you know i was thinking about that for a long time and um i was sitting over in callaway minnesota on the white earth indian reservation waiting for a meeting with winona laduke and, um, you know, Winona and I are funny because I'm always a little bit early and she's always a little bit late and we know this, but yet we, um, we continue to have this problem when we're meeting that I end up waiting. And so I'm sitting in her office waiting and I'm looking at this picture that she has leaning on the floor. It's like about 24 by 16. It's pretty big and it's pretty annoying. So if you want to show the next slide, um, this is the picture I was looking at. So I was looking at that and I knew that it was buffalo skulls that those men were standing on and standing by. And I knew the backstory that, you know, the American government killed, you know, they say 1.5 million buffalo. Um, our tribal folks say it's more like 50 million buffalo. Nonetheless, it was millions of buffalo and they just killed them and let them rot in the sunlight because they were, they did nothing with them because they were trying to, um, make natives comply um, with what they wanted and, and be dependent on the government. So at one point, um, the government paid the settlers like, I don't know, $2.50. Uh, there's a fly bug in me, I'm sorry. I just gotta keep swatting him away. They paid him like $2.50 a ton or something like that to go about the prairies and pick up all the, the skulls and the skeletons because they were gonna grind them down and. I think they turned them into fertilizer or something, but I'm sitting there looking at this and I went, oh man, that is a picture of the first definition of nutricide because they were intentionally killing people through nutritional manipulation. So I was like, wow, I wonder if there's more pictures, um, you know, what's the story? So I started collecting pictures and I'm only gonna share a few with you tonight and a few thoughts, but if you wanna share the next slide, um, you know, when they started coming to Minnesota, um, you know, the settlers started coming, but first came the, the, you know, the land speculators. The land speculators, very rich people on the East Coast, they had um, paid staff that was in those survey units and they were giving them information about what was the value, you know, what areas were of most value. I think if they were doing that today, it'd be called insider trading because those rich guys from the East, you know, they grabbed up the land that was of most value and then you know they just started logging everything off and um you know if the forest is your kitchen and that's where you get your food and somebody comes along and you know clear cuts it and starts actually clear cutting the entire state um you're really in trouble so this word up here gone away them that is when uh, a word that we have always had in our language about starving um you're really hungry um if you're in that state but I find it interesting that the way we refer to cutting a tree, a gawa, is part of this word, gawa. You're making him, you're cutting him off. You're making him fall over with, uh, with um, you know, it's causing death, really. That's what we're talking about. So um, those actions that we saw, we, uh, we kind of incorporated them into our language. And it was very telling of how we incorporated, incorporated those actions into our language. So um, next slide. Um, the land was just, you know, devastated. I guess that's the thing that I'm trying to, 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 to bring home to people is that we were a healthy, vibrant, uh, you know, we had so much food and we were so healthy and, and suddenly within a period of like 
really 50 years, um, everything was gone. And, you know, these fires came into the landscape. Um, Minnesota had some of the largest wildfires um, in the nation really early on. Uh, the Hinckley Fire of 1894 and the Cloquet Fire of um, 18, no, I think that was 19, like 1918. Um, both of them burned like uh, close to a quarter of a million acres. Both of them had a lot, of, a lot of loss of life. The only loss of life that was counted was the, you know, the the settlers. The, I, we don't know how many, how many natives perished in that fire, but you know those fires killed like, you know, around 400 and some people. Both of them. Um, just driving home the the point that you know what happened to our food system was apocalyptic for us. So you want to go on to the next slide. Um, another picture that I find interesting, that's a river, um, just clogged with logs. Um, that rivers were our Ojibwe main style of uh, transportation. We were canoe people um, and we went everywhere by canoe. So, you know, a lot of these rivers and lakes were clogged with logs so we couldn't travel the way we always did. It also uh, caused a lot of problem and havoc with the aquatic life, as you can imagine. There are actually some early studies from like the late 1800s where they're actually starting to think about the impact of this logging situation on the fish. And um, I can't remember the year of that study, but it was like they did like 84 miles of the Mississippi River and found, you know, like one live fish um, because it was really, this stuff is really impactful. So next slide. So um, there's this, you know, one of the things I was reading, I read a lot of the surveyor notebooks, like the notes that they took on what they were seeing when they were um, surveying the land. And um, one of the early surveyors was talking about how, much, how many trees there were in Minnesota. And, you know, he had climbed to the top of a pine tree every, I don't know, six miles or whatever and look around. And he made this entry in his journal that he said like, um, 70 mills in 70 years wouldn't begin to make a dent in the, the forests of Minnesota. Well, um, it was only like 50 years and about uh, 20 some mills um, and most of the timber had been cut. The first, you know, virgin forest was slashed in that period of time. And so these dams created a lot of problems for us especially those clans that were fish clans. So like there's a lot of sturgeon clan, bullhead clan, turtle clan. And as we were doing this, um, you know, indigenous human health and ecological risk assessment tools, one of the questions we started asking people was well, what happens if your clan is sick? Or what happens if your clan is gone for whatever reason? Um, like take, for instance, the woodland caribou. There are caribou clans. Caribou, because of the logging, were extirpated from Minnesota and now only live um, for the north in Canada. So what happens to you when your clan is not here? Same with the sturgeon um, in these dams. If you look at the historic name places throughout Minnesota, there's a lot of, um, you guys are probably most familiar with the term uh, namekin. Uh, that's actually a mispronunciation of namekong. Uh, Nama is the name of the sturgeon, and we're saying where the sturgeon live. So um, Namakan Lake is actually the Mekong. And a lot of the sturgeon are only in that Rainy River uh, ecosystem. So what happens when that, the, the clan that you belong to is not here? Um, basically, the elders say that um, they feel that we cease to exist um, as Anishinaabe people if our clan is gone. So. Um, that's something to think about. So next slide, I'm trying to move on to something happy and I just can't get there. <laughs> um, you know, we were struggling, you know, the forests were gone, the rivers were clogged, um, the animals were moving. And another thing that was very impactful to us was the fact that there was a huge demand on the East Coast, you know, the richer people in New York and whatever for wild game. And, um, the wild, the story about wild game is, is really interesting um, because that's, you know, where laws came from. 
And if you guys are interested in um, reading a really interesting book, it's called Crimes Against Nature. Um, this got another part to the title too, but um, it's by a guy, his last name is Jacoby. And it doesn't really tell the indigenous story very well. Um, but if you've ever heard your uncles talk about, or your grandpas or great grandpas or whoever, how old you are, during the depression when you know they couldn't feed their families because there were game laws, um, that's a pretty interesting read about uh, the USA and their uh, construction of conservation and game laws. But um, so next slide. And it wasn't enough that they clogged the rivers and cut down the trees, then they just started digging into the earth, which um, for us as Anishinaabe, thinking about the earth as our mother, um, this is just extremely painful. Um, so Minnesota had the first uh, open pit mine in uh, the largest, the world's largest and first open pit mine. So all this stuff happened, in, you know, in a period of about 50 years. Um, my great great grandma, who I didn't know, but you know, she passed on stories. Uh, she was of the caribou clan. So she talked about, you know, the caribou leaving and how painful that was. She talked about some of these things. And then my grandma told me these things uh, just about in that period of time, what she saw and, and how she felt about that. So um, if you go to the next slide, yeah, here comes part two of my uh, picture story of uh, Nutricide and the intentional death of a body of knowledge concerning food. Again, I didn't really put this together until um, I was actually in a workshop on historic trauma and someone put up this slide. This is a picture of uh, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Um, boarding schools in the United States were the um, brainchild, if you will, of a guy by the name of General Pratt. And the goal and intention of them was to kill the Indian and save the man. So depending on, you know, there's like about a hundred federal boarding schools and I, you know, no, too many to mention, um, like Catholic boarding schools. And so depending on what school you were required to go through, this practice went on for, you know, 80, well, 80 years of it, you know, being mandatory that, you know, like I say, depending on where you're at, at least by age seven, you were taken from your family and you were put in a boarding school. And oftentimes, depending on where it was at, you didn't even get to go home to ever see your parents until you were done with school, you know, like, and you were almost grown. And you were not allowed to talk your language. You weren't loved, you weren't touched, you weren't hugged. Um, they separated siblings. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of trauma but also, we forgot about our food in that period of time. I mean, how could we hang on to that? And we did hang on to pieces of it. Um, and that's how we're piecing it back together is because just about everybody has something that their grandparents or parents hung on to um, that was theirs. They wouldn't let that go. Um, so I just have another slide of um, the boarding schools. I personally didn't go to boarding school. Uh, my mother and, and father did, though, and uh, very, uh, very painful experience. And it's not even my story to talk about or tell, but I do believe that I carry um, things in within me that are a result of things that happened there. So um, the next slide. So I was talking about all these things, my story, my food story that I was putting together. I was sitting with an elder around the fire during the sugar bush time. And um, he was talking to me in Ojibwe. And um, I'm not as fluent a speaker as I would like to be. But he was talking about me being, and he was using this word, Abinabi Young, the word at the top of this slide, Abinabi Young. And I had not heard that word. And I was like, um, trying to figure out what he was saying to me. And I really wasn't sure. So I'm like, what? what are you saying to me? And he said that um, he was teasing me about always looking back, that I was always looking back. And it kind of, um, Abinabiyad is kind of what my friend started calling me, the one who was always looking backwards. That's how I understand that. And so, I, you know, we joked about it and I kept laughing and I was telling him about blood memory. I, I believe in blood memory because sometimes when I teach somebody something, um, you know, say archery, for example, um, if I'm with young kids and they could have never, you know, shot a bow in their life, 
And I give them a little instruction, not a lot. And I swear within an hour, they are starting to get precision and they're starting to get accuracy. It's like they know how to use that bow or, you know, you know how to make that berry basket. You just know. And I believe that's blood memory. And I, I told him, I said, I, I don't think you have to learn. We don't have to learn how. We have to remember how. And um, I just always kind of liked that and thought I'd share that with you tonight. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, the point of that slide is um, a great medicine man from Leech Lake. He said that being Anishinaabe isn't a privilege, that it's a responsibility. And so, you know, as we, as I look for mentors, you know, because I know how to do some things, but I certainly don't know how to do everything. And I'm always looking and asking questions about, hey, what did we do about this? Or what did we do about that? And I find people that know, that have that knowledge. I always say like, hey, will you teach, you know, can you teach somebody that? And um, they always get really shy. We call it being Indianish, like, oh, I don't know that much about it. Um, but they do. And so like, I, I always remind them what Jimmy Jackson said that, you know, it's a responsibility. We have to piece this story back together again. And we have to get healthy together. And we can't do that without you because you're a piece of the puzzle. And the reality is, is that everybody in our community is actually a piece of that puzzle. So next slide. Yeah, I probably should have pulled this one out. Basically, what I was just saying is that, you know, our current food system is just not sustainable. Um, it, it's so energy intensive that it takes far more energy to produce the food than, it, than we're getting from eating it. There's so much waste. Um, we have these monocultures um, that are really actually very dangerous. I mean, that's how that, you know, Irish potato famine came about is because Irish, you know, there's like so many kinds of potatoes, but they only like this one kind of potato and they only grew that one kind. And then, you know, it got blight and disease and, you know, so we're at risk of those kinds of things, disease and pests. Um, we have to use so much fertilizer and pesticide. You know, the meat's got hormones and it's just not healthy. It's just not healthy. So next slide. Um, it's all about quality and not quantity. So this is a slide that I found that it's talking about, you know, the diversity of, of various garden vegetables. And so what we're really working on, like I said, as Anishinaabe, we were hunters, we were gatherers, so we definitely need to have that wild game. And we need to have healthy forests that support, you know, the indigenous berry systems that we had. Um, but we were also, you know, we did the corn, beans, squash, and sunflower deal. And when you look at this little chart, what it's telling you is that, you know, they're saying there's like 307 varieties of sweet corn. Well, sweet corn to me is not the kind of corn that's really the best. I mean, all corn can be sweet if you eat it when it's green. Um, but what we had as indigenous people, we had flint corn, flower corn, popcorn. Um, and there were like, I found a citation one time that this guy was a seed collector and he had identified 84 varieties of flint and popcorn from the Great Lakes tribes. So, you know, 84 varieties, that's a lot. And as Anishinaabe people, we had really pushed um, you know, agricultural very far north because it's all the way up to Saskatchewan with the Ojibwe and the Cree up there um, growing corn and beans and squash. So we went really far north in, in growing. So it's really important for us to get these indigenous seeds back. Um, some of them are in private collections. Some of them are in museums. But um, some of us are working really hard to repatriate those, bring those home, do um, germination, analysis on them and then you know like start growing them so that we have our own indigenous seeds back in our community again and next slide so this is a i, I really i'm kind of think i'm i think this is like next to my last slide and i really wanted to to leave you with this thought um a friend of mine uh, dr dan um, longboat he's a haudenosaunee instructor at uh, trent university he took that give a man a, a fish thing and, you know, he took it to the next level. He took it to the indigenous level. So he said to me one time, he said, if you give a man a fish, you'll eat for a day. If you teach a man a fish, you'll eat for a lifetime. But if you teach a man to understand his relationship to fish, you change the world. And I love this. I love this so much because, you know, that's what I work for in my community 
is to help people understand their relationship to food. And we may not be changing the world, um, but you know, we're changing our world, <laughs> we're changing our community, we're changing our families, uh, we're changing ourselves individually because every bite of indigenous food that we ate, I feel like we're regaining who we really truly are. And so for my last slide, I just want to leave you with um, a group of pictures that I have taken. Um, and this is, I tried to, and I did duplicate the original pictures. We are still doing, you know, what we did for thousands of years. Um, we're picking berries, we're gardening, we're ricing, uh, and, and we're, you know, Iskamizi Gawin, the sugar bush, the, the fishing under the ice. And, you know, that, that ricing thing, that's never changed. We're, we've been ricing that way for a long time. We've been boiling down our sap from the maple trees the same way for a long time. We don't have uh, evaporators and stuff. We, <laughs> we like to sit with our sap. We like to watch it happen. We like to be with it. It's that relationship. And that's so important. So I thank you very much for listening to me tonight. I hope I didn't run over. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Nate. Thanks so much for, for uh, sharing that with us, Shirley. Uh, yeah, so as Shirley said, my name is Nate Erickson. And I am a co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Menu Incorporated. Um, I know it's confusing. It says M-N-Y-O-U. So who knows what it actually actually means. But when you look at the M, you'll see that there are some lines in it. And it's supposed to look like a menu. So the idea behind it is thinking about what is on your plate. Um, and are you getting enough of what you need uh, to live a healthy life? So before I jump in, I just wanted to let you know three things that I don't know if I explicitly mention in um, this talk that, I'm, that we're about to have, but I just wanted to let you know that I hope that you're able to catch some of these themes that, um, that will be coming up. So one of them is the importance of challenging the power structures in your own communities. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see that come out in, in the way that we have done it here in Wilmer. Um, number two, flexibility is key. Be flexible and innovative and be willing to uh, change on the fly. And then number three, you can do anything. Because if uh, a dude like me can pull off what we've pulled off here in, in, the, in our community, literally anyone can do it. And I'm not, uh, I don't know, I'm not kidding. Anybody can do it. So you can see the pictures here. It's just a collage of some pictures from the last three years of our project. In the bottom right corner, you can see a cute little baby chilling in a, uh, in a car seat. And that is my son, Nolan. He comes to our CSA box drop-offs with me. Uh, throughout the week and I just wanted to have him on there number one because he's cute but number two because uh, you might hear him in the background here <laughs> as the night progresses because he's getting older and he's getting louder so anyway again my name's Nate uh, menu is the project that I am a part of here in Wilmer Minnesota our program has been around for a few years now but it looks a lot different now than it did back in 2015 and 2016. But before I can tell you about all of the cool things that we're doing now, I think it's super important to share where we've come from. So back in 2015, uh, one of my menu partners and, and co-founder Ben Larson and I were working for a broadband grant at our local community college, which is called Ridgewater College here in Wilmer. They also have a campus in Hutchinson. So for those of you who might not know much about it, Wilmer is a city of roughly 20,000 people. And of that 20,000 people, roughly 36% identify as non-white. The area's economy is driven heavily by sugar beet producers and turkey manufacturers like Genio and Wilmer Poultry. Uh, we got a lot of turkeys in this area. As it is with many rural communities, Wilmer uh, which typically isn't blatantly unwelcoming, uh, but there's definitely room for improvement when it comes to helping new people feel welcomed in the community. So in the last few years, Wilmer has really seen its immigrant population grow with many of its new residents coming from East Africa and more specifically, Kenya and Somalia. Our job while working at Ridgewater, we were education and employment advisors uh, our job there was to grow and diversify the school's computer science and technology programs. 
Uh, and this is something that we all that we always look back on and, and can't help but laugh about because when we started, um, and maybe if you know anything about IT, uh, it's not that diverse. The program at the time consisted of white males between the ages of 18 and 45 and one solo 30 year old, 30 something year old woman. Uh, so the bar for diversifying the program was set super low. So literally anything we did would have been, uh, been better than what, what they were doing at the time. Luckily, we had a supervisor that encouraged us to think outside of the box and to try new things and things that had never been done before at the institution. The only rule that he had for us, um, it was that we were to know every name and that we were to know every story. And that rule is something that is really at the core of what menu and the work that we do today, it's still there. That is at the core of what we do. Unlike traditional college fairs and high school recruiting events, uh, we decided that the way that we were going to recruit for our program was to go to where the people were instead of having people come out to us. If you know where Ridgewater College is located here in Wilmer, it's located like three or four miles north of town. So for people that don't have vehicles or um, access to public transportation, which is very poor here in Wilmer, there's really no chance for um, people to get out there uh, in a timely fashion. And I shouldn't say that the, the, what we have here in Wilmer is, is fine for what we have, but we can always use more. So we decided to go to where the people were so we started hanging out at popular hangout spaces throughout the Wilmer downtown. And lucky for us, those places were mostly small restaurants and small markets. And the reason I say lucky uh, is because we got to work and eat delicious food at the same time. So uh, to me, there's literally nothing better and that situation could not have been better uh, for us. So by the time we really got rolling with our work, it was mid 2017. Donald Trump, who had just become president, started promoting his initial Muslim ban. Uh, myself, Ben, and Abdueli, uh, who was actually one of our close friends that we had made while doing our recruiting events downtown, um, we got really pissed off. Like we were super unhappy with the idea of even spreading this kind of uh, message to the nation and especially to our friends and neighbors living uh, right next door and throughout the Wilmer community. So we got really upset and sickened by the discourse that was being held nationally. But what made us even go a little more crazy was that um, the people in our community in Wilmer were saying these nasty things. And some of our so-called leaders were being a part of it as well. So um, Candy, Ojai County, if you, if you don't know anything about it, um, it's the county that Wilmer's located in, and it's a super red part of the state. Um, so the things that were being said about our friends and neighbors, uh, it was really starting to push us over the edge. And so one evening, we all started brainstorming ways that we could uh, make a positive impact on our community. Instead of uh, taking it out in anger and getting uh, upset, sorry, my cat is uh, chilling here too. Um, instead of using our, any negative energy that we had, we decided like, hey, we got to figure out something that we can do to make a positive impact on the community. Ben and I, um, we're very aware of our whiteness and the, the privileges that come with it. Um, but we decided that, you know, we should figure out a way that we can tap into that whiteness and those privileges to better the community instead of... Uh, just sitting back and, and letting these things happen. Um, but we, we really wanted to make sure that whatever we decided to do with our friend Abdueli, um, you know, we didn't want to tokenize him. We didn't want it to be two white guys and their Somali friend doing these, uh, these projects. So um, at the time, Ben was finishing his social work degree where his capstone project was dedicated to researching food deserts and the impact that food deserts have on communities. Sadly, Wilmer is not only in a food desert, but it is actually in a food swamp. And a food swamp is uh, something where, you know, the main stretch of your city is filled with fast food restaurants and gas stations and things like that. Wilmer, if you drive down First Street, is completely packed full of, um, of fast food. It's, uh, I don't know, I, 
sadly, I also do enjoy <laughs> fast food once in a while, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's a food swamp. So as our conversations continued throughout that week, we realized that, you know, besides being upset about this and wanting to do something for our community, we realized that every time that we got together, we were eating something, whether it was the delicious homemade goat meat and sambusa Abdueli's wife, Deco, was making, or like the super spicy, like way, way too spicy, I'm kind of a wimp, um, but super tasty homemade salsa and chips that Ben's Mexican mother-in-law makes. Um, there was really never a time that we didn't have great food to go with our great conversations. So this is where the idea for the menu Youth Garden originated. We combined our love for food, youth development, and the love for our neighbors and turned it into something really special. We wanted to address access and price in our local food systems while giving diverse youth an opportunity to be part of an entrepreneurial experience that would uh, give them a chance to have ownership of a program, uh, to be a part of their community, to feel like they're a part of their community, and to show them that there are opportunities to work and do things that are not in a factory setting or not having to deal with turkeys. But really the most important thing was that we wanted to make them feel like they are welcome in the uh, Wilmer community. The only problem with the idea that, that uh, we originally came up with, the youth garden model, the only problem with that model was that not a single one of us knew anything about gardening. So it, uh, it, not only that, we didn't have any money to get started. So um, instead though, of letting that hinder our excitement, we decided to, uh, to dip into the, uh, the, the Nike slogan and just do it. One of the very first meetings that we had uh, to share our new idea, it was with the University of Minnesota Master Gardeners, a program which I now work with, <laughs> working for uh, the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, that first meeting, we shared our idea, and at the time, we were talking about having a four acre garden, growing a ton of vegetables. We were just gonna fill a four acres full of vegetables and we were gonna grow exotic vegetables, fruits and vegetables uh, that were not accessible in Minnesota. And then we were gonna give them all away. And as you might've guessed, people that are lifelong gardeners, we got laughed out of the room. Looking back now, they were totally right and we probably just did deserve to be uh, laughed at. Uh, but they did laugh us out of the room. Uh, but looking back, it, we knew that it was a project worth fighting for. And we look back on it now and, and we laugh ourselves. We were obviously, of course, we were a little upset when we uh, left the room that night. But something that I also, in thinking about this program, um, something that I grew up being ashamed of, but have come to appreciate now, is that I grew up in poverty. For most of my childhood, we had just enough to get by. Um, but after my parents divorced, my, my father was a, a bad alcoholic, um, but he was able to find sobriety. And after they divorced, both my parents were able to remarry. And during that time, we found ourselves experiencing a middle-class lifestyle and even dabbled in wealth for a bit. Um, so because I've been fortunate enough to experience all three of these different lifestyles, I like to think of myself a little bit as a chameleon and have been able to infiltrate. I like saying that word because it's a cool word, but um, I mostly mean that I'm able to fit in in most any setting when it comes to communication. Uh, I don't mean it in that I would ever use it in a malicious way at all. Because of these skills, we approach organizations like Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Vision 2040, and the Blandon Foundation all organizations that we had never had any connections with to in the past. And we, we just thought, hey, man, we, lo we love this idea. We're going to try it. And we quickly found ourselves with $30,000 in grant funding to start our project. So because we were able to utilize these communication skills and tap into uh, power within the community, decision makers, people with money, um, and power that we would normally never have access to, we were able to pay 30 kids to work. We were able to send vegetables home to each of their families every week. And we were still able to sell 
leftover vegetables at local farmers markets. Um, and truthfully, there was really no better start to a new organization. Again, this was back in 2016. Um, it was the best start we could have imagined. Everyone in the community seemed to really love what we were doing. And the word seemed is key there. So not everybody loved what we were doing. A story that's really changed and shaped what we are doing now. We were at a farmer's market one weekend and that weekend both Ben and myself were out of town and Abdweli and two Somali youth were running the booth that day and they were at the market and a gentleman wearing a, um, a veteran's cap and in a wheelchair, a powered wheelchair, drove by and he said, F you Muhammad. And he threw a pig's foot onto our vegetable table um, and completely ruined all of the produce that our kids had grown that, it, that, that summer or that week, I guess. It was, he didn't ruin the entire summer, but the, all of the vegetables we had to throw away, the guys started to drive away. We were fortunate enough that Abdueli chased him down, took his picture, and we got into a, a huge legal battle with him. We tried to avoid it, and we tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I mean, I'm saying try. Uh, we offered to have coffee so we didn't have to go to court with him or do anything like that. He refused, and so we ended up taking him through the, uh, the full legal process. But because of that, we decided that we would never allow our kids to be exposed to something like that, especially in our community. And we decided that because of this, we were gonna give a big F you to this guy and people in our community that think like him, and we were gonna start doing even more. So we decided to reshape menu and the way that it operates, and we turned it into a CSA program. And for those of you who don't know what a CSA is, it's a community supported agriculture program uh, where each week people get boxes full of vegetables and um, they get it for about 18 weeks. So with our um, new CSA program, we turned it into a buy one, give one model where anybody that is able to afford one, we uh, sell it to them. And in return, we give one to somebody that is unable to afford it um, and also senior citizens and really uh, anybody. Nobody is turned away. We'll find a way to get them vegetables because it is our belief that um, access to fresh, locally grown, affordable vegetables is a right that everybody has. And it's something that we are trying to spread deeply and continue to infiltrate into our food system here in Wilmer. And we're hoping that our model will be solidified here within the next two years that we'll be able to take it statewide and then hopefully take it uh, beyond that as well. Um, so again, we started this new program. We've also started building a deep winter greenhouse so that we can have vegetables throughout the year for everybody um, that's a part of the program. We're becoming master gardeners, uh, not an FU to them, but we, <laughs> because we like them and they have been helpful. Uh, but we want to continue educating folks, youth and adults alike, so that our community can start um, becoming more sustainable throughout locally produced uh, fresh produce. Um, so I know I'm running over time and I've gone through a lot. Um, so please, when we're done here, I am excited for any questions that you might have, but I just wanted to end it with this and just let you know, like I said at the beginning, if three guys like Ben, myself, and Abdueli, three guys that have no um, gardening skills at all, but we love our community, we love our, our, our neighbors, and we really wanna make a change here in the community. If any of us, uh, if, if we're able to do it, anyone willing to put in the work and to be flexible and to change on the fly, if, if we can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, so again, I, I like the, uh, the Nike slogan, just do it. And that will bring up uh, Jamie. Jamie Bain will be jumping in here. Hi everyone, I am just giggling behind my blank screen. I think Nate is one of the funnier people that I know um, and certainly had me laughing out loud uh, here in this room by myself. Um, 
But hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Jamie Bain. Uh, as you all know, we all work for the University of Minnesota Extension. Um, I come at food justice from this kind of weird angle, which I think this is why they put me last. Um, Shirley has this, you know, like really powerful way of understanding um, food through the Native lens. Nate is running this amazing program that's really shifting the culture in Wilmer. And I come at my work through um, really, really a policy and systems lens. Um, I also am very values driven. And so everything I do is really driven by these core sets of values that are all um, really about being anti-racist. So for me, that's about being authentic, focusing on relationships, cooperation, collaboration, and distributing power. Um, and that looks like a variety of different things in my work. Um, it looks like uh, coordinating, coordinating a network, much like Food of the North or Cast Play Food Partners. Um, it looks like participatory grant making, and it looks like um, facilitation. So it's not traditional food justice work, but we'll get to um, how I really see it as being integral to food justice work. Um, I just want to lay out like this foundational platform that we understand that our food system was never created to feed everyone. Our food system was put in place as a system of oppression, as most systems we are now realizing in 2020 um, have been put in place to help white people thrive and to help black, indigenous, and people of color be oppressed. Um, and so our food system started as Shirley and Ruth both discussed by um, stripping land from Native Americans and committing genocide. And then we enslaved Africans to grow our food. After that, we've done um, a number of horrible things to uh, keep our food system moving in the direction that it has. But um, just today, we, are, um, we have immigrant and migrant workers, most um, Latinx growing our food using chemicals that uh, we know are harmful, extremely harmful for the human body. In fact, other uh, developed countries won't allow our food to be distributed there because of the uh, magnitude of harm that our chemicals have um, to human bodies. Uh, literally every sector of the food system has black and brown people working at uh, below a living wage. And so we can see even in today's food system that it is still perpetuating the system of oppression and is, and is not working for anyone. Um, as a white person, I find it, um, I first just want to say how grateful I am for Shirley, Shirley and Ruth both telling their stories and how gener generous that was um, to be able to hear that and to understand that because as a white person, I am continuing to learn and always learning and taking with, with a grave importance my role and my ancestors role in creating these systems and recognizing that I'm not an ally to black indigenous and people of color. I don't like that term. We created the system. We're not supporting them in dismantling the system. We need to be actively taking a lead in dismantling this system and supporting black indigenous and people of color in what they do. Um, so I just want to get out, get that out first and foremost about what sort of drives my work and that might give you more of a perspective on why I do what I do. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is a network, uh, the Metro Food Access Network, which is transitioning to be called the Metro Food Justice Network, started about eight years ago. It has 400 partners across the Twin Cities Metro that um, really span every sector of the food system from emergency food to aggregating food to distributing food to schools to uh, just just about every aspect of food and we come together to um, to reduce silos we realized that we were being really competitive for grants the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing we were constantly stepping on each other's toes as we were trying to do similar work so we needed to have a network so we could get to know each other better and start working more collaboratively and we knew first and foremost that we wanted this network to be about relationships really trusting and authentic relationships because we know that when you have any anything, a project, an organization, or a network that's really founded on trust and authenticity, 
it will naturally move to alignment and then collective action. And that's certainly what the network did over time. Our goal was to um, create more equitable access to healthy food in the Twin Cities uh, through trusting and authentic relationships. And we have been able to do exactly that. Uh, we have a couple collective action projects that we're really proud of. One is that uh, a group of um, emergency food shelf partners, our emergency food system partners, uh, came together to start a program called Super Shelf, which is transforming food shelves, uh, started in the metro, but now across the state and even gonna go national soon, um, transforming food shelves to have more of a grocery shopping experience. So it's not such a stigmatizing experience for people. Uh, and then we've also transformed uh, 50% of the comprehensive plans, at least 50% that we know of, of the comprehensive plans in the Twin Cities Metro to include food for the first time. So that means any zoning or regulations or city or county planning until 2018 did never include food. Uh, and so it's really important that we made that shift and we hope that those uh, comprehensive plans are actually being used and looked to. Um, and additionally, we've really centered anti-racism within our work. And so one way that that has looked for us is that we hosted a series of critical conversations on race in the food system, which is a series of six workshops, a lot like this, but more focused on conversation and relationship building and more topic specific uh, about anti-racism and white supremacy culture and what we can do to dismantle um, racism within our work in the food system. And so that has actually, um, there's been a big shift in the metro food system since that series took, took place. So there have been uh, a huge uptick in um, the number of Black, Indigenous, and people of color hired into food organizations, and more programs are explicit about how they're being anti-racist. So that's just a little bit about my philosophy of networks. Uh, I work really closely with Noelle Hardin. We have the same passion. She's in the Fargo-Moorhead area. We have the same passion for networks, which is really understanding that relationships are and connectivity are what alignment and collective action are built off of. And through that network work, we have also realized that there are two other things that are hugely important. One is participatory grant making and the other is facilitation. Um, participatory grant making we got into because we heard from our black indigenous and people of color partners that they have the skills, they have all the internal, internal resources, they have the knowledge, but they don't have the funding. And what we know about typical philanthropy is that they fund well-resourced organizations and they, fund, they tend to fund the same organizations over and over again. So if you're doing something innovative, um, it's really hard to get your foot in the door. What we also know is that there is $8 billion available for foundations to grant out to communities. Of that $8 billion, most don't go over their 5%, which is obligatory um, for tax reasons. And of that 5%, only 7.5% is granted to Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So we knew that the system wasn't working and we knew that we had the power and privilege to be able to change that system. So we um, procured some funding from our SNAP Ed program and from a couple of other sources and did a shared gifting process for communities, black, specifically black, indigenous and people of color working on food justice. Uh, we completely flipped the process on its head instead of having people complete um, overly complicated uh, proposals. We asked for them to not spend more than two hours of their time uh, writing a proposal, writing a poem, sending a video, really giving us any sort of format that they felt most comfortable with. I even met someone in a coffee shop for them just to talk through their proposal with me. And then we completely took ourselves out of the decision making equation by allowing them to decide who got funding and for how much. After that, we didn't ask for any reporting. We just brought them together on a quarterly basis to get to know each other better and to ask each other for support. So not only were they getting funding, they were deeply invested in each other because they were the ones funding each other and then getting together on a quarterly basis to get to know each other and support each other and breaking down these silos between food justice projects across the state. So that's why we got into participatory grant making and that's why um, we really understand that that's, that's another system that's keeping the food system and, and especially the nonprofit system where it is, is our, our um, 
the way that the philanthropy system works. And so we're really trying to pivot that system in order to pivot the food justice system. Another thing that we're really passionate about is facilitation. I adore facilitation. I think it's fun and imaginative and playful and creative. And I love working with people and getting to know people. I've gotten to know Shirley and Nate, uh, these two on my screen, uh, through a food justice facilitation cohort. Um, and I just totally geek out about this stuff. And I get frustrated that it seems to be a somewhat elitist skill. You have to pay thousands of dollars to get trained in this skill. Uh, it, there are some that sort of use it in manipulative ways. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just not right from my perspective. I think we need to um, give everyone those skills because to me, being a quality facilitator is about dismantling the system and decentralizing power and creating an equalness between every voice and every space. And so if everyone was able to be a really quality facilitator, imagine the shifts in the system we'd be, be able to have. Imagine if we were able to hear Shirley's and Nate's voice just as much as we were able to hear some of our political leaders' voices and imagine what types of shifts that would make. Um, so through our food justice facilitation series, we try to um, spread the wealth of facilitation knowledge through uh, food justice experiences to anyone and everyone who's interested. So you can tell that my work is really different from Nate and Shirley's, um, but also still very much focused on dismantling and shifting these systems. So uh, I am gonna uh, ask, I'm gonna shift it back to Ruth, and I think Shirley and Nate, we're all gonna put our videos back on and allow Ruth to bring us into our Q&A time. Awesome, what a great, Group of people, it's so honored to be in this space with all of you. Um, it's, it's a little different in not being able to like, um, I was gonna say, let's give them a round of applause, but. <laughs> um, so to the audience, we wanted to see if you had any questions at this time um, that we could ask the panelists. Um, there was a virtual applause there. I really, um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just want to say thank you to all of you for providing your insight and a little bit about the amazing work that you're doing. Um, it's so very needed and I appreciate the diversity that each of you bring. I was taking notes and I, I really, um, surely I really appreciated hearing, you know, the self-sufficiency versus government dependency. And I think that is so important um, through I see that common theme through all of the work that each of you are doing, you know, by empowering our communities to garden, because like you said earlier, um, Nate or Shirley, you know, about um, fishing, you know, if you teach a man to fish and then get to know, you know, the relationship with fish and then relationships, you know, it's so rich in knowledge, like you mentioned, Shirley, you know, rich in cultural knowledge values um, and just the common themes of collaboration, distribution of power, you know, our, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, I really love, Nate, that you touched on the master gardener um, component. We tapped into their expertise at United Tribes Technical College and were able to get community gardens going. And Jamie, you really brought it home with touching on the funding disparities. And it really brings to mind, I guess I can ask this question, um, why do you think it's so challenging or why do you think um, funding is an issue with uh, people who need, need the support the most? You know, I, I see so many positive benefits from helping empower our community members to learning how to garden, you know, getting back to their roots, so to speak. But um, I see so many good wellness benefits for gardening and the work that you're doing. So why, why is it that it's so, um, that it's a challenge to give funding to people who may need it the most, you know, to become self-sufficient. If somebody wants to um, share your thoughts on that, that would be great. Anybody? I got something if, uh, if nobody else does. I, for, in my experience from what I've noticed, so as I mentioned, uh, maybe too many times that uh, I really didn't know what I was doing getting into this. That also included not knowing how to write grants. So when you look 
through all of the funding that is available. And there is a lot of money available through different organizations and things like that. Um, the application process is ridiculous. It, there's like way too many things needed. Um, they ask your financial history of your organization and things like that. So I would say that the, the uh, application process is overwhelming and not, if you don't have any um, experience in it, it's really tough to get started. Um, and then number two, um, they do require you to have um, your 5013C or, or um, some sort of nonprofit status or be a part of an organization or have an organization that is willing to be um, kind of your, uh, what's the word for it? Your financial backer. I, I can't remember. I don't know what word I'm looking for here. So um, I think those two things are especially challenging because um, like I said, I think if people, if you can find the hub of grants, which is also something that's hard to find, um, when you get there, it's really hard to start doing them. Thank you. We have a question in the Q the Q and A box um, from Noel Hardin. Can you talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted your food justice work? Shirley, I'd love to hear from you first. Um, it's impacted a lot because I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, one of the things I did to help is I had some extra funds, and I. Uh, you know, people started gathering up seeds right away. I don't know. I don't know what they thought was going to happen. But anyways, I was able to, um, you know, get enough, um, you know, organic heritage seeds for 100 families to grow gardens. And I distributed those along with some fruiting trees and shrubs. Um, but what I see happening in the communities themselves is even though there was a movement toward understanding the need to move to um, you know, a more food secure um, place. Uh, now, instead of walking, they want to run there <laughs> because they saw what happened. And so I, I feel like I'm getting all these phone calls and emails like we want to do this and we want to do that. And um, I feel like, yeah, it's good to run. Um, but let's, you know, do some planning uh, while we're running. And, uh, but, it, you know, there's, a, it, it, there's ex an excitement about it. Um, not so much uh, an urgency because, oh, everything's going to go to heck in a handbasket, but there's actually some excitement about it. Hey, we've been talking about that. Let's get off the couch and do it kind of thing coming up now. So, Yeah, I totally agree with that. It seems like we've hit kind of like the policing system in Minneapolis kind of hit yep. like all of a sudden, like, let's shift this system. We know it's not working. We need to shift it. Um, I feel like we're kind of at that point with food, which feels super exciting because I think the three of us and so many others have been waiting, like what is going to be the tipping point for people to realize that this food system isn't working. Um, and I think we're either getting there or we're there right now. Um, and so I think there's a lot that we can be doing to really start um, I was going to say creating networks, but I think even before creating networks, it's building movements and then those movements create networks. So I think it's about like Shirley said, like we have, I think a lot of intentionality to be building behind these movements right now with a lot of potential for some big changes in the next couple of years, because people are passionate and fired up and ready to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question. As individuals, what questions should we be asking people running for public office to improve our food systems? I think that's so funny. I don't know. I'm kind of in like a blow it all up phase right now because I'm like, I don't want to improve our food system. I'm the whole new food system. <laughs> So I think the question needs to fundamentally shift and be like, how do we create a new food system that works for everyone yeah. um, and see what they have to say about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm with great? you on that, oh, Jamie. Sorry. I think, uh, oh, sorry, Ruth. No, I, was just gonna, I was just going to chime in and say that, um, you know, I think the, the two huge questions that I have conversations with folks and um, 
I've recently was a part of the Rotary, Rotary Club here in um, Wilmer, and that's a group of, of business folks, like unreal amounts of money for, for a lot of them and things like that. And they're trying to do a lot of good things in the community. But we, uh, our project did a presentation there, and we brought up the idea to them that Wilmer is in a food desert, and they did not believe it. They didn't even with like data and everything, they're like, well, there's a so-and-so grocery store over here. And I'm like, well, you're not understanding the definition of a, of a food desert because we are in one. And so I think to me, that's one of the biggest questions is, you know, one, do you recognize that there is a problem with the food system uh, where we live? And two, um, you know, you would obviously have to look to see if you are in a food desert. I would assume that a lot of communities um, are a part of, or at least some pieces of almost every community are experiencing a food desert. So that's like two questions that I, that I ask everyone right away. We have another question. Thank you um, for your answers. What are your feelings on internationally imported food goods in the region? Shirley, I see you shaking your head. <laughs> well, some of it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, the way I hear about, you know, milk going all the way around the world or like the, the Somali community in St. Cloud needing to get their goats from Australia. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to use so much energy when we could be producing those things here in a, more, in a healthier way providing jobs, eating better, and being kinder to the planet. I, I just don't know why we aren't, you know, more self-sufficient as individuals, but as, you know, communities and as, as a country as a whole. I, I just, I don't buy into that global stuff too much. I would say I'm an inch deep and a mile wide in the food system and a mile deep and an inch wide in like facilitation and participatory practices. So whatever Shirley says about something relating to the food system, I'm like, yep, that's just whatever Shirley says, I'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, just to piggyback on Shirley, you're, you said exactly what I wanted to say. and. Um, I don't know what it's like in the Fargo-Moorhead area for, um, I'm thinking specifically for like um, Somali folks or um, people that are co uh, coming to these areas from Kenya. Um, my uh, Abdueli, who is our partner with Menu, he also has a market in downtown Wilmer and all of the goat that he gets in is from Egypt. And there is no place in Wilmer where anyone can, that's their primor, primary protein is goat meat. And there's no place in Wilmer that you can get fresh goat meat. It's all frozen, coming from Egypt, Australia, all over the place. It, it makes no sense to me, especially in an area of the state that prides itself on being a farming community and of uh, you know, being these uh, farming families and producers. And you know, no knock on them, but um, it just doesn't make sense that we, that we don't have it. Thank you so much for um, answering that question and all of these questions. And it was a, an honor to be in this virtual space with all of you. I'm going to turn it over now to Annie Wood to wrap us up. Thank you, Madzigidads. A special thank you to Ruth and all of our panelists. We are so grateful for your time and your expertise tonight. I also want to thank our partners um, who helped put on the event tonight, the Cascade Food Partners, the North Dakota uh, State University Extension of Cass County, and a special shout out to Noelle Hardin who helped connect us with our three folks tonight. Noelle also works for University of Minnesota Extension. And we're just really grateful that we live in a community where people are willing to share so much of their time and their talent and their expertise and willing to make connections because I think 
um, we all recognize that community has a really important role to play in moving toward a more equitable food system. Um, as our panelists shared tonight, the food system is really not built to serve all of us and there is so much work to be done. And so I think we all recognize the need to show up and do the work. And I hope tonight has given you some new perspectives and a deeper understanding of what food justice looks like in action, some new terminology to consider, and some new ideas to um, to roll around in your head. We know that this is not easy work to do and we're really grateful that we have so many folks who are working hard on it. And I encourage you all to think of, about how you can step in and uh, do your part. So we know it was a lot of information tonight and we did uh, record this this evening. So we'll be sharing that um, after we get a little bit of editing done. So you can watch for that to be posted. And of course, if you enjoyed tonight, please share that with others who you think might also uh, appreciate learning from these uh, really, truly wonderful educators. And uh, also, if you are looking for something to do with your next Friday morning, August 7th, um, our normal First Fridays program resumes in August and we will be speaking with uh, three local winemakers and growers who will share some of their knowledge and expertise. A pretty different topic than tonight, um, but we also are looking forward to learning more from those folks. So thank you again for joining us. We couldn't do the work we do without members of our community stepping up to support and to show up. And we hope that each of you can take what you've learned tonight and start to put it in practice, whether it's supporting the work that these folks are doing or looking for ways to make the food systems that you are part of more equitable and more just. Have a great rest of your Tuesday night. Thanks for tuning in.